Worship the Lord before you go to battle. Now, two questions. First off, what did Solomon ask God for? Anybody remember? Remember what he asked? Wisdom. Basically, yeah, okay. Okay, and that's, that's a good answer because that's what he got, right? But, and do you remember why he asked for it? So he could rule the people. Exactly, exactly, exactly right. So, go with me to 1 Kings chapter 3. And we are going to read through this. And starting in verse 5, and let's look at it. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, You have showed unto your servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before you in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And you have kept for him this great kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And notice he said, you, you've done these awesome things for David because he walked before you upright. He did what he's supposed to do there. And we all know he made mistakes. But whenever you're, when God says, ask what you will, that's not the time to bring up the mistakes. <laughs> all right? And he says, he starts telling me, he says, and, and you've even given him a son to sit on the throne. Well, the son was the person talking, right? So he's right. Now watch in verse 7. He says, And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant, Solomon, king instead of David my father. And Now watch what he says. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. You hear that? Now, if you were here at the 9 o'clock, you know what these two terms mean. And we're going to see this, and I'm going to show you uh, how many times this is used when it talks about going out and coming in. And most of the time it is used with coming in and then going out, but there are times like here where it says going out and then coming in. Well, you say, well, what's there to know? You go out, you come in. You go out, you come in. It's not a big deal. No, notice what he says. He said, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just a child, and I don't know how to go out or to come in. Well, he's not talking about, I don't know how to leave the palace, right? He said, I, I, I don't know. So there's something more to this than just knowing how to exit, you know, going out the exits, right? Or, or how to get in. He says in verse 8, And your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people, that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Now watch what he says. Now give therefore, because of the great multitude, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy great so this thy so great a people. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. So he could have asked for anything, but he said, Give me an understanding heart. He noticed he didn't even really say wisdom. He said an understanding heart that I can judge correctly, that I can do what's right for your people. He said, you've got a great people here. There's a lot of them, and I need some help, God. I need, I need to know these things. But the first thing he said was, I'm a child, and I don't know how to go out or come in. Then he says in verse 11, And God said unto him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked for yourself long life, Neither have you asked riches for yourself, neither have you asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to your words. Lo, I have, and this is God speaking to him, of course. Lo, I have given you a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like you before you, neither after you shall any arise like unto you. And notice, why did he give it? Not just because he asked. One of the main reasons God gave him what he asked was because of what he didn't ask for. You see that? He didn't ask for riches, didn't ask for a long life, didn't ask for, for and this is what I got it, didn't ask for the lives of his enemies. He didn't say, God, I love you. You give me anything I ask, kill them. Kill them all. Wipe them out, make my life easy. Right? Notice he didn't do that. Matter of fact, God even offered that to Moses one time. said, I'll wipe them all out and start over, right? And Moses said, no, you can't do it. Don't do it. So, but notice he said, because you didn't ask for anything for yourself, 
I'm going to give you what you did ask for, and I'm going to give you more than that, because no, watch what he says. He says, uh, verse 13, And I have also given thee that which you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto you all your days. Hear that? He said, you didn't ask for money. You didn't ask for these things. And, but it, you just, you wanted for the people and you asked for the people. And because of that, I'm going to give you these things even though you didn't ask for them. What is that? He's doing exceeding abundantly all that he could even think or ask. So you can still see the grace of God. Even in the Old Testament, you can see how God was always working. What was he doing? Was he doing that for Solomon? No, he was doing it for the people. But, now, but Solomon got the blessing because Solomon's heart was for the people. Do you see that? So the key is not finding, you know, how do I get my prayers answered for the things I need? No, the, th the real essence here is get you off your mind and look at how you, can, how you can be a benefit to the body of Christ and to the people in general. And when you do that, you really don't have to worry much about your stuff. All right? So he says here, uh, verse 14, And if... You will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments. As your father David did walk, then I will lengthen your days. So now, he also even gave him long life, which is exactly what he said you didn't ask for, but I'm going to give you a long life too, right? But now notice too, he says, if you will do what your father David did. But how many of you know David messed up? You know, but he said, if you will walk like your father David did. Well, yeah, he messed up, but guess what else he did quick? He repented quick. And so he said, yeah, you're going to mess up. I get it. You know, I'm, I'm God and you're not. And I, I look at you and you're humans. I see that. You're going to mess up. But walk like David. Walk in my statutes. Keep my commandments. And when you blow it, repent quick. Make it right quick. Don't spend time wallowing in it. Get right right away. Amen? That's a key. Now, Numbers chapter 27. <clears throat> and remember... What Solomon said at the beginning, I, I'm but a child, and I don't know how to come in or go out. Numbers 27, verse 15. Now, this is Moses talking. And Moses spoke unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. Right? Now, and, and you want to you know, write these down and, and get the scriptures down so you can study them later. But notice you want to underline, set a man over the congregation. What's he saying? He is saying, Moses is talking here, and he's talking about putting in the next leader. So he's talking about a transfer of leadership, and he's saying, God, here's what you want to do. He said, I want you to set a man over the congregation that will be the leader that you want, right? And then he says, now watch this, verse 17, which may go out before them and which may go in before them. There's that same terminology, going out and coming in. You got that? And which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Notice what he, he says it again twice. He says, I want you to, God, we need a man that will know how to go out and come in. And we need a man that will also know how to lead your people out and how to bring them in. So what is he saying? Now remember, well, we'll show you here in just a minute. Let's go ahead and read the rest of it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand upon him, and set him before Eliezer, the, pri the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. In other words, you tell him, you give him this commission, you give him a charge, and you do it in front of everybody. So everybody will know if he's doing what you told him. You don't make, it some, don't make some secret deal. You don't tell him, here's what's going on. No, you make it public. You put somebody and you make that charge public, right? Then he says, verse 20, and you shall put some of your honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. In other words, that's why you gotta do this publicly, and why you have gotta lay hands on him, and you gotta make this transfer of power uh, done right, so that the honor that the people has given you will be put on the people that you have now assigned. All right? Then he says, now go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 31. <clears throat> but did you see the words in, in verse 17 there? Which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, 
and which will lead them out and which may bring them in. Remember those words, going out, coming in, right? Deuteronomy 31, in verse 1. And Moses went and spoke these words unto all Israel. And he said unto them, I am a hundred and twenty years old this day. So what day did he say it? On his birthday. Isn't that right? Okay. He says, I'm a hundred and twenty years old this day. Now watch what he says. I can no more go out and come in. But how many of you know this says that whenever Moses died, his strength was not abated, neither his eye was neither was his eye dim. Remember that? So he, he wasn't saying, listen, I, I'm a hundred, I, I, you know, I'm just too old to do this. I can't do it anymore. He, he wasn't saying that. He was still in good physical shape, right? He said his, his natural strength wasn't abated. In other words, he still had all the physical strength. His eye was still clear. He had, and people say, well, you know, when you get a certain age, you, you know, this is what happens. You gotta, no, that's not true. Don't buy that lie. Moses was 120, and, it, and his eye wasn't dim. Amen? Come on. You can fight for things, right? And, and, but I'll tell you what, if you're renewing your mind to the television drug commercials and the medical commercials, then they'll have you doing all kinds of stuff before you ever hit 40. Right? So don't, don't renew your mind of that stuff. Un, unrenew your mind from that. And renew your mind of the Word of God. Okay? Then he says, watch this. And I, here's that term again. He says, I'm 120 years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. So now he knows that, okay, I'm getting to the end there. The Jordan's over there. They're at the mountain. And he's given this whole thing. And as I told the uh, 9 o'clock class, uh, that Moses actually spoke all of this at one time. The whole book of Deuteronomy was spoken at one time. He stood there and spoke the whole thing, and they wrote it down. And as he spoke it, then it says, when he finished speaking these things, he went up on the mountain and died. Right? So it was, that was it. Now, <clears throat> notice this. He said, I'm 120 years old, and I can no more go out and come in. And yet, he, he wasn't saying, because I'm old, I can't do this. He was saying, this, this is the time. This is it. This is, I'm done, and I'm going to pass it to them, and now I'm going to go be with God. Notice it wasn't this, oh, that's going to be sad. I don't want to go. God, can't you give me five more years? Can't you give me... It wasn't any of that, right? Let me tell you, if you... <clears throat> they said about John Lake, when, whenever he passed, they said when he came, he found us there in Spokane. He said he found us sick, defeated, thinking that victory was over there. But he showed us that victory is over here. And, and that is all true. And, and you, you can see victory in the Word of God. You can see the kind of life we are to live. And it's to be a victorious life, an overcoming life. Amen? At the same time, the, the more you spend time with God, the more heaven becomes real. And Paul said the same thing. He said, man, he said, I want to go. I would love to go. He said, but for the benefit of the church, I'll stay here a little while longer. Now think about that. The more, and, and, and I'm not, something happens when you meditate upon and, and spend time with God in worship. But something happens when you start realizing that, yes, we are to reign here. That's what Revelation says. Revelation, what, 5.10, I think, says, we shall reign on earth, right? So we are to reign here. And, and, but yet, the more you spend time with God, who is a spirit, and the more you spend time literally in the spirit realm and walking in the spirit, the more draw heaven has on you. And the more you just want to stay there. You, just, you, you, you visit God in that sense. You know, and we know God is with us. You walk with Him. We know that, right? But you can also walk with people and never spend time with them, right? You can walk with them and not visit them. You can walk with them and not fellowship with them. But the more you fellowship with God, the more you want to be where He is, right? And I know we, we're seated in heaven. I know all of that, right? And all that is a spiritual reality, and our physical reality should begin to match that. And all I'm saying is that there is, the more you begin to spend time with God, the less you want to spend time with earthly stuff. Mm 
I'm not talking about earthly people. I'm talking about earthly stuff, about things. You don't want to talk about that stuff because it, it, you realize how fleeting it is. And here Moses is retiring. This is his retirement speech, right? And he's already named somebody else. He named Joshua to, to come in after him. He spent a period of time now of actually uh, training him, and he's already been with him. And you, we're going to see this in just a minute because the, 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 the details here are amazing. And he says, um, <clears throat> but, but the key here is this, I can no more go out and come in. But yet he still had the same physical strength. I know I keep repeating that, but I want you to realize when he said I can no longer, there's something to these words about going out and coming in that had nothing to do with being able to walk through a door. Amen? So what was he saying? Well, let's go on. In John chapter, and you say, well, that's, Chris, this is good, but this is uh, all Old Testament. You know, what about New Testament? Is there a reality to this in the New Testament? Well, I'm going to give you one, and then I'll come back and give you another one. Well, I'll, give you, I'll go ahead and give you both probably. In John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out. Now notice, if you enter into him, you're going to be saved. But then it says go in and out. So he's not talking about going in and out of Jesus, right? You get in Jesus, you, you want to stay there, right? You don't go in and out of Jesus. So he's not talking about that. He's saying, listen, if you, if you get in me, you're going to be saved. And then you're going to come in to the presence of God and you're going to go out. Now what we have to find out in just a moment is what it's talking about when it talks about coming in and going out. But here we see it in the New Testament that in the New Testament in Christ there is a coming in and a going out. N not in and out of Christ, right? But there is something that we get to do because we're in Christ that other people cannot do. And part of that is coming in and going out. You got that? Not coming in and going out of Christ. Please, I, I'm, I'm going to keep reiterating that because I don't want to be like, said that once you get saved, you can go in and out and do anything you want and you can just you know, go in and out of Christ. I'm not saying that, right? I'm not saying that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's look at another place. Mark chapter 1. Those of you in the 9 o'clock service, you remember this. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. <clears throat> it says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Notice, and just as I told the nine o'clock, notice what it says. He went out and departed. Now, that is redundant. There's no need to say he went out and departed. If you say he went out, it means he, he departed. If you say he departed, it meant that he went out in normal language. So there is something here, the same words, going in, coming in, going out, went out, you see, all of this goes together. So here it is in the New Testament too. We see the same idea in John 10 and here in Mark 1 that in Christ even, and even Jesus himself, saw the need to come in and go out, right? Now when he went out, he was going out to come in. And that may sound crazy, but I'll explain in just a minute. He was going out to a desert place, the Bible says. He went out to a solitary place, a place where there were no distractions, is one way it's described, he went into a place where there's no distraction. He went to a solitary place. Now get this. He went out to a solitary place so that he could come in. Come into what? Well, let's look on. It says, uh, yeah, I want to go on. Yeah, go back with me to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua 14. Now, as I read these first three or four verses here, uh, you know, don't, don't just tune me out or just, I mean, Listen to what's being said, but we're building to something in this passage that I want you to hear. And this is kind of the prelude to it. So just kind of follow along. Picture yourself there. And these are the countries which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed for inheritance to them. And we're not going to go into all of these, right? But I just want you to know what's going on. They'd gathered everybody together. Eliezer the priest, Joshua, who is now the, the leader, and all the heads of the tribes of the children of Israel. They'd all gathered together, and they were going to discuss and distribute the land. Now, they had moved into the promised land, and they were going to distribute the land that was given to each person just as God said, right? So Joshua is fulfilling what Moses started. And now watch, he says, in verse 3, uh, no, I'm sorry, verse 2. By lot was their inheritance, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses, 
for the nine tribes and for the half tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of two tribes and a half tribe on the other side of the Jordan. So in other words, he'd already said that to them, and now the other nine and a half are getting their allotted you know, portion. But unto the Levites, he gave none inheritance among them. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. Therefore they gave no part unto the Levites in the land, save cities to dwell in with their suburbs for their cattle and for their substance. Now, I'm not going to say this doesn't matter, but I want you to understand, this has no relevance to what we're talking about right now. It matters because all the word of God matters. Okay, But don't get caught up in all this. We're, we're getting somewhere. Verse 5, as the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. Verse 6, then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him. Now notice, who is Caleb? This is the same, he, Caleb comes to, to Joshua, and it's the same Caleb that went out with Joshua and the other ten spies, right? And he, they go out, now watch, and so this is, so Joshua knows Caleb. They're buddies, right? Everybody else came back with a bad report. We can't take the land. These are the only two. Now, the only two people that said we can do it are now talking to each other. One's the leader, and the other one is now 80 years old, right? Now watch this. He says, <clears throat> then the, well, yeah, I'm gonna, and, and Caleb uh, said to him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Now, you, you, okay, you got to understand, Caleb had an attitude, right? He's 80 years old. He's been there and done that. He's won battles. He, he had faith. He was aggressive type person, right? And he comes to Joshua, and I love the way when I'm reading this, I can just hear his voice, you know. You can see this 80-year-old man standing in front of his friend, when everybody else looks at him and goes, oh, it's Joshua, oh, Joshua. And Caleb walks up and goes, yes, Joshua, we're buddies, we hung out, we went, we went across, we went in there, we were the two, yeah. You know, yeah, you ought to show some respect, right. Why? Because we, we know this stuff, right. And he looks at Joshua, who's his friend, and he says, you know, you remember what God said to Moses and that Moses said, you remember. Now, he's, he's bringing this home. And he says, you remember. And watch this. What the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning me and you. You remember that? Forty years old was I when Moses, a servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. You, he sent us, you remember, you were there. He sent us both out. And I went out, and I, when I came back, I gave him the word was in my heart. Not the word that was in my eyes, because I saw the same thing as these other guys. But the word in my heart was, we are well able. Remember that? And he says, nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. You remember that, Josh? Remember how they all, they were all turned coward and they all said we couldn't? You remember that? So you've got to put yourself in these places. When you read these stories, don't just read it in the King James or something. Put yourself there. Realize every, people, people's basic character, their basic personalities have not changed. People are the same today as they were then, and they had some of the same attitudes and things. And God used people, not born-again people, He used people that had certain attitudes. Right? And He says, and you remember... Nevertheless, my brethren went up with me and made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon your feet have trodden shall be your inheritance, and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. And as he said, these forty and five years. right? So he said, Now here I am forty-five years later. And I'm still alive. And now I want the promise. I want the inheritance. And he said, everywhere my foot touched back then, it's mine. And I want you to remember, that's my ground. And you're going to allot that to me. Why? Because that's what God said. And what is he doing? He's reminding J Joshua what the Lord had told him. Right? He says, even since the Lord spoke this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day four score and five years old. Eighty-five. Right? Now look at this. Look at verse 11. As yet, 
I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Here I am 45 years later, and I'm just as strong then and now as I was then. Isn't that amazing? Now think about it. And he wasn't even born again as we know it, right? How much stronger should we be today? How much more should we have life? You know, just from a totally natural viewpoint, your body recreates itself, different parts of your body recreates itself over different periods of time, right? And in a matter of time, you're a completely new being, but because your cells and things have re replicated itself, you still look like you, but because we're in this fallen world many times, that now there, it has degenerated a degree. But there's nobody that says it has to be that way. Even back then, he said, I'm, I'm 85 years old, and I still got the same strength that I had when I was 40 years old. Isn't that right? And then he talked about Moses, and we know what happened to Moses. Moses here at 120, and I'm sure he, he was thinking, look at Moses. He's gone now, but whenever he was here, the day he died, he was just as strong as he ever was. Amen? Don't buy into the lie that you have to degenerate gradually and just essentially just disintegrate. Amen? Now, I've been waiting to preach this message for a little while now. Okay, this is, I, I was talking about it a couple of weeks ago, if y'all remember, talking about, I was talking about this thing. And I, I didn't know the Lord was going to let me do it the day after my birthday. I didn't know that, okay? But I got to admit, I felt a little bit like Caleb. All right? And so, and so and now, he's, now watch this. As yet, I am, as, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then... Even so is my strength now. Now look at this. For war, both to go out and to come in. You hear that? When it talks about going out and coming in, when he says here, my strength is the same. I can still go out and fight like I ever have. And he says, and I can go out with the same strength, and I'm going to come back in. Now that means that's twofold. Number one, that means I'm going to go out in the same strength, and I'm going to win. That means I'm going out to win, and I'm going to come back. That means if you see me go to battle, you know, keep the light on. I'll be home soon. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to go out there and die. I'm not going to go out there and get beat. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to come back. When I come back, I'm going to come in victory. And now notice when he says, and, and both to go out and to come in. And here's the key. When they went out, when they came back in, as I told you during the 9 o'clock, the first thing they did when they went out to battle, when, when they came back in from battle, the first thing they did was they all, all the soldiers, everybody, had to go to the temple and praise God for the victory of the battle. Hallelujah. Amen? So now, you've got a victory. Now, there were different kinds of battles. And we said earlier, there was battles that they would go into, and the wars sometimes would go on for a long time. If the wars went on for a long time, many times they would trade out soldiers, and they would tell some of the ones that had been on the front line, go home, rest, recover, you know, get built back up, get refreshed, and they would come into the temple and begin to worship God, so that, and notice, they would go, they would come in, to worship, coming in means to go into worship, and then they would be refreshed, and then they would go back out to war. Now, that's what, two, and again, two, uh, two layers, two, uh, two, uh, I don't know how to say it other than that, but when you come in here on a Sunday morning, yes, there, that's, to many people, that's the coming in. You're coming in, you're going to worship, you're going to be refreshed, you're going to be, and, and your worship is not just singing, right? Your worship is your life. You have to realize that. But you come in and you're refreshed. Why? Because you've been in the battle all week. So you need to come in. So when you come in, what's the first thing you need to be doing when you come in? Sure, you should fellowship. Sure, you should talk. But you ought to come in and go, you know what? I need refreshment. Right? I, and right now, I'm just coming in and I'm going to worship God. Notice here. In, um, where are we at? How far did we get? There we go. Down to verse 11. Here he tells us the answer. Now go back and remember the scriptures that we have already gone over that have to do with coming in and going out. Even Jesus, it said he w rose up early before daylight, right? And what did he do? He went out. And what did he go out? He went out to pray. So what was he doing? He was going out, which means to go to war. But he was going out to pray, which, me which means he was going, coming in to the, to the presence of God, if you want to use that term, and I, I'm real careful how I use that. But we need to realize that for him, going to battle was going to pray. Do you get that? He won the battles before he ever faced the enemy. Now, you say, well, this is all good. This is a whole bunch of Old Testament stuff. 
What about the New Testament? Well, well, I just gave you one with Jesus. I gave you John 10, 9, which talks about you come into him, you'll be saved, and then you come in and go out. So what does that mean? You're in him, you're going to come in, meaning also what? That you're going to worship and spend time worshiping in his presence, recognizing his presence, and then you're going to go out to battle, right? But going out to battle does not mean going out to fight, because we have to realize we don't fight against flesh and blood. Isn't that right? Let me ask you this. Are we still in a war? Is there still a, or are there still battles to be fought? Of course. But we don't fight against flesh and blood, right? So we fight against spiritual powers. So how do you fight against spiritual powers? You can't fight physically. So you have to fight spiritually. So if you're going to fight spiritually, who are we fighting? We're fighting the gates of hell. Isn't that right? How do you beat the gates of hell? I told the 9 o'clock group uh, this very thing. He's, Jesus told him in Matthew 18, he says, that on this revelation of who I am as Christ, I will build my church. And the gates, and he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. And I'm sure somebody said, uh, why? Well, because to you, I give you the keys of the kingdom. And now notice, in these keys of the kingdom lock and unlock the gates of hell. You can bind or loose by your words, which are spoken to God, Right? In this sense, now I'm talking about you spending time in prayer, in the presence of God, recognizing His presence. And I know His presence goes with you all the time. I know it's there. But how many times do you walk around a whole day without just taking a moment to acknowledge His presence? And, and I, I will promise you this. The days you forget to acknowledge His presence, those days are the days your battles are the hardest. Those are the ones where you feel like you're fighting alone. But the days that you acknowledge His presence, those are the days you know we're in this thing together, and we're going to win. Why? Because you acknowledge your presence is with me, and I know that, right? And when you do that, you realize, yeah, because greater is he that's in me than he that's in them. And you know that you're going to win your battle. So, so coming in has to do with spending time with God in worship. Now listen, you go into his presence, and then you go out to, to win the battle, right? You don't go out really to fight the battle. The battle is fought in his presence whenever you're alone with him. And when you go out, you're not going out from his presence like they did in the Old Testament. You're going out with his presence, right? And so just like Jehoshaphat did, what did they do? They started praising, sent out the praisers, and what? They didn't even have to fight. Now, that's the best kind of battle. And then the ones where you don't even have to fight. It's, they're beaten before you get there. And all you have to do is spend a couple of days gathering the spoils. Amen? Now watch, he says in verse 12, he just told me, he said, my strength is the same. I can still do war. I can still go out and I can still come in. I can still go out and do war and I can still come in and worship the Lord. He says, now therefore give me this mountain. Whereof the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakims were there and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. Hear that? He said, he's talking about going to war again, 85 years old. And he said, I'll go drive them out. They ain't staying there. God gave me this land. It's already done. Right? He said, I know how to go out. I know how to come in. And if you know how to come in, you'll always be able to go out. If you know how to come into the presence of God, recognize the presence of God, walk in the presence of God, experience the presence of God in your everyday life, let me tell you, going out, facing those battles, easiest thing in the world. Easiest thing in the world. Why? Because you already know it's already done. It's already, he, my enemy's already beat. I'm just going to go out there and look good. Why? Because it looks good winning. Amen? Then he says, watch, in verse 13, and Joshua blessed him. You know, this is the first time Joshua does anything. So far, Caleb's been preaching. You know, right? Preaching on, going on, telling him, oh, and you remember what God said. And you remember Moses said. And you, this land, you remember we went out there. We saw this, and everybody else was scared. And we come back and say, we can do it. And you, now give me this mountain. And Joshua says, phew. Go do it. It's yours. Right? I mean, he didn't, what's, there, what's there to say? Right? And then Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron as an inheritance. It's yours, man. Go take it. Isn't that right? Not even an argument. Right? Okay, go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 18. And then uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 18, verse 12. And watch this. It says, And Saul was afraid of David. Because the Lord was with David. You hear that? Saul was afraid of David because God was with David. And, and notice, and the Lord was departed from Saul. 
So now Saul knew, well, God is with David and he's not with me. So what did, what did that do? It gave Saul fear. Okay? When you don't, when you know God is not with you, or you don't know God is with you, you will walk in fear. Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him captain, made him his captain over a thousand. Now watch. And, he, and so, now get this. Saul was afraid of him, so he says, I don't want him near me. I'm afraid of him. Why? Because God is with him, and I know God's not with me. So I want him over there. And watch what he did. And he made him his captain over a thousand. Captain, military term, over a thousand soldiers, right? Look at the next word. And he went out and came in before the people. Who did? David. David was made a military captain, and he went out. For what? Battle. And came back in. For what? To worship and give praise to the Lord for what he had done on the battlefield, for what God had done through him. You see that? The same terminology, went out and came in, had to do with battle and coming back in to give praise for the victory. Do you see that? Now watch. And if you remember, they, it said that what made Saul mad, one of the things that made Saul mad, was they would sing songs about David. And they would sing them about Saul and say, uh, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has tens of thousands. Right? And that's another reason why it developed a jealousy with it. Verse 14. And David, now watch this. And David, who had done what? Had been, he had went out and come in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. Notice, the stronger David got, the more afraid Saul got. Verse 16, But all Israel and Judah loved David because he, what? Went out and came in before them. In other words, they all saw what, that God was with him and how he went out to battle and won and how he always came back in and gave praise and worship to God. You got that? Now, look at, um, well, a couple of things. First off, and we're going to go to Matthew 28 next, so if you want to get ready for that. Notice, coming in is for what? Worship, right? You come in, you recognize the presence of God. But now, going out, went out, for war, for battle, exactly. Now, it does not mean going out from the presence. It means going out with the presence. And then for us. Are we still in the battle? Absolutely. What does Paul tell us? Put on the whole armor of God. Why do you need armor? Because you're in a battle, right? So we know we still have the same thing. We're still in a battle, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, Matthew 28. Matthew 28 is known, especially here. If you come here very long, you've heard Matthew 28, right? Especially 18 through 20. And verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying... All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Now, do you see what he's saying here? What's he telling? What are they going to be doing? Going out. going out. Isn't that right? And to what? He said, all authority has been given to me. Now, if they're just going out just to, and I'm going to say this very carefully, understand this. If they were just going out to preach and say, things are great now. Everything's different. It's good. Right? Uh, we're here to tell you good news, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to be t telling? But if that's all they were doing, if they were just going to say, hey, listen, everything's fixed, everything's good, it's all great, he would not have had to tell them, listen, I have all authority, therefore you go in my name. You get that? He wouldn't have had to tell them that. If everything was good, he wouldn't have to say, go in my authority. He could have just said, everybody tell it. Just go tell it, it's all good. But he didn't say that. He said, listen, I want you to go out, and you're going to go out to battle, and you're going to go in my authority. And because I've been given all authority, then you're going to go out, you're going to go to all nations, and you're going to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, which means God is superior to anything that is against you. Do you hear that? So what was he telling them? You're going to go out to battle in my name. But now notice what he says. Watch this. He says, you go out. Uh, go ye therefore, teach all nations, disciple all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. So what's he telling them? Go out. Go to battle. Go in my name. Right? That's Matthew. Now look at Luke. Luke 24. In verse 44, notice what he says. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. 
Then opened he their understanding. What did, Sol what did Solomon ask for? An understanding heart. Okay. Which means what? He got wisdom. So what do we get? We get wisdom. Why? Because he has made wisdom unto us. Isn't that right? Why? That they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Look at verse 47. And that repentance and, re and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, the original Greek does not say, and that repentance and remission of sins. It says repentance for remission of sins. You hear that? Should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So what's he telling them? You're supposed to go into all the world. Isn't that what he just said in Matthew 28? He said, and, and here's what you need to know. You're going to go and preach repentance for remission of sins to all nations, right? So this is another way of saying Matthew 28. Now watch this. And you are witnesses of these things. Now, verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. What was he saying? Listen, guys, you're going to war. But first, come in. But first, have the Spirit of God fill you. Why? So you have continuous communion with the Spirit so that the Holy One is in the Holy of Holies because know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the living God. So he says, you're going to go out, you're going to fight, you're going to go out to battle, and you're going to win in my name because my authority is with you. But before you go out, wait and make sure that you have me. Make sure that you have me in you and you have communion with me. Make sure that you come in before you go out. So, last thing, I promise this last thing, uh, for my part, and then we're going to do one other thing real quick. But we're doing good. we got good time. So, um, I want you to picture this. Have you ever seen the shows, maybe movies, uh, something, where you got, maybe it's high school or something like that, and you got the, 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 you know, the cool crowd, right? You got this, this and, and sometimes there'll be bullies, and it's this crowd of bullies, and there's always some scrawny little kid that the bullies want to pick on. They knock his books out, and they just, you know, lock him up in a locker, something like that, right? And they're, have you ever noticed so when they're doing that, and they'll, be, man, they'll come up on this kid, and they grab the kid, and they're like, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this to you, and you're not going to do anything. And about that time, this kid seems to have this friend that is like the guy. You know what I mean? It's like everybody knows that's the toughest guy in school. And for some reason, he likes this kid. And every time they start to grab him and they're going to do something to him, all of a sudden, this guy turns the corner and goes, hey, what's going on here? What, what, what's happening? And they're kind of like, oh, nothing. We're just, you know, we're just trying to, you know, he's, you're okay now. You know, we're just trying to smooth out his shirt. You know, his shirt was wrinkled. We just, you know, because, well, I was just wondering because it looked like y'all were fixing to try to beat him up. Oh, no, 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 we wouldn't do that. No, we, 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 we wouldn't do that because we know he's your friend, so we wouldn't do that. But, you, you, but you, you see the story, right? You've seen this over and over again, right? Yeah. Now think about that. What did it say about Saul? Saul was afraid of David. Why? Because God was with him. Why can't we believe that the devil is afraid of us because God is with us? Why can't we believe that the devil won't even literally try to attack us? Now, I understand, you know, there's, there's battles and I, I get that. But why can't we have more faith in God's keeping power his protecting power than we do in the devil's attacking power. And start to realize that we can walk for it. That Jesus was in the midst of them. They were going to throw him off a cliff, a crowd. And he just turned in their midst and walked through them. Why, why can't we believe he would do that for us? Why can't we say, you know what? I know this. Today is not my day to die. And because of that, I'm going to live. And so whatever's coming, no, it's not going to touch me. Though a thousand fall at my left hand, ten thousand at my right it will not come near me. It will not come near my dwelling. It will not touch me or mine. Why? Because God is with me.